Well, I'm really excited about this last episode of the series that we've been doing on self-awareness. And part of the reason I'm so excited about this last episode is because we've been talking a lot about tools, tools of self-examination and self-discovery. And as we dive more into these tools, the goal and hope is that it pushes us more toward God and not away from God. He is the God that made us and knows us better than we could ever know ourselves. So walking in step with Him is crucial. It's the crucial ingredient, I think, for self-awareness to really flourish. Mm. So today, we are talking about attachment to God. Mm. Why do I believe what I believe? And how does it impact my attachment to God? Yeah. So Joel, we're gonna really lean into you today. You know, in our last last episode, we talked about attachment style with people. Yeah. And so we felt like it would be really wonderful to talk about our attachment to God. Yeah, I think that's so good. Um, I wanna start, so when we do theology study, and Jim, Lisa, you know this, uh, my area of specialty that I studied for a long time is biblical theology. So the unraveling the story of God from Genesis all the way through Revelation, patterns, themes, and things like that. There's another uh, section of theology, it's called systematic theology. And systematic theology takes a look at particular uh, topics or ideas or themes that are present and tries to see how those topics are worked out throughout scripture. And um, so I'm gonna say something now that's gonna might put you a little bit off, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna back into it a little bit, okay? So here's, here's this thought, that God actually is attached to himself. God is attached to, and you're, I know, Lisa, you're like, wait a minute, Joel, we're going to have to pause and reconsider. Just listen to this. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are a perfect triune community. Hmm. That they are pre-existent, yeah. they are pre-eternal, they, um, they are in beautiful love in communion with each other. I had a Bible college professor once, um, and he was trying to help all of us kind of make sense of the Trinity, this idea of the Godhead, that God is um, one in essence and yet uh, present, three distinct persons. So what does that look like? This is how he would say, if you went to God the Father and you're like, God the Father, you are crushing it. You created the entire world through like in the universe, through the breath of your existence. And God the Father would respond and say, yeah, but did you know in John 1 that it actually points to the Son? that God the Son is actually sustaining all things. And, and, and God the Son actually gave up his own life to, uh, on the cross. And then if you went to God the Son, you're like, God the Son, that's incredible, the cross, like that was you. God the Son would be like, yeah, but did you pay attention to God the Holy Spirit? God the Holy Spirit in uh, Luke chapter four is the one who anointed me. This is what Jesus says in Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim and release to the captives and recover uh, sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, the, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, and I mean, this is what, what Jesus would say. And then if you went to God the Holy Spirit, you're like, God the Holy Spirit, like, you must be it. Like, you are crushing it in all, all fronts. And God the Holy Spirit would be like, yeah, but, I mean, how incredible God the Son and God the Father and, and, and how much they love Him. Like, you know, we get this sense that in the Godhead, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have perfect attachment, have perfect relationship mm. in and of themselves. And so when we think about attachment theories and self-attachment and all these other things, I think it's a profound concept and a consideration for us to actually know and realize that the God himself is together in perfect relationship. And then Jesus, and I know Jim, you've got some thoughts on this one. Jesus in the high priestly prayer, his goal, I mean, he says, um, I long for you, he's talking to his disciples, I long for you to be one as I and the Father. Yeah are one, mm -hmm. right? So there's Jesus' language. Stop talking about his attachment to God the Father. Jim? Uh, the first thing I thought, honestly, is, yeah, and that attachment statement Jesus made is what got him killed. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's uh, true. Yeah, I just, I mean, it's like, you know, you, you just really say that? You didn't. Jesus said that. I, I love that, the idea that we are 
not just uh, the Imago Dei, that we're in the image of God, but we are Trinitarian. Mm. And the, bearing that, and, and should be in an old theological word, is perichoretic, you can Google it, but the neighborhood, the very nature of God, that perfect relationship that we can be in that. And then we come to the human side, and often I have found people on the more anecdotal clinical side that they will have these glasses right here. Uh, Lisa said before on the, I have to have these on all the time. She said in the last uh, taping we did, she said, do I put the glasses on or not? And it's the, the reason I'm using that is, is people will pick up these glasses and say, I will put them on, but this will be mama and daddy. And I will then look at God as a mm. heavenly version mm -hmm. without even trying of my mother or my father. That's why we do this family of origin work back there. And I am transferring stuff onto God and not giving him his face, Paul Young, uh, who wrote The Shack, and that's not a commentary on that, it's just the fact he said, I had to continue to unmask God time and time again before I could say, God, this is who you really are. And so this deconstruction word, don't worry, I won't go too far, is I think there's a healthy deconstruction of sitting and saying, hey, wait a minute. You might have been, I went to Dallas Seminary, then I was in more of a reformed camp, and, and I like where I am now, right. but the idea of just continuing to grow and learn and say, God, who, who are you really? That was mm -hmm. asked through much of the Bible, and so there is a deconstruction I can do there of saying, maybe I've just been in this denomination, and I believe this and believe that, or I believe sometimes unhealthy things from, quote, the faith of my childhood or the lack of faith. People who have all kinds of religions um, that, that I've been with and saying, what is it that you believe? Mm -hmm. uh, who do men say that I am? Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? Mm -hmm. You know, I like that because Jesus yeah. did not ask Peter. It's, it's in the, uh, you know this, it is in the plural, who do y'all say yeah, that I am? Plural, yeah. And that's the question today for the God attachment is, hey, as you're watching today, I don't know, who, who, who do you say God is? Who is God to you? Mm. Mm. I'll admit when I hear that word deconstruction, we yeah. talked about this before. We did. Mm -hmm. I'm like, er, push the brakes because so many times I think that word equates for people reconstruction to the destruction that's of so their good faith, mm -hmm. and that's not what we're talking about. Mm -mm. We're talking about taking apart maybe things that we have believed that were maybe put on us that's that exactly actually right. cause us to be resistant to God and taking that stuff off of us so that we can come back to having a better relationship with God. Well, if I used yours, if those are readers, or you use mine, which is a trifocal here, I'm legally blind in my left eye, true. So there's, you know, but I have this lens here. If you did this, and there have been people with a trifocal in here that could literally fall downstairs watching it because this lens was not meant for you. And to get my lenses right and say, God, I wanna search and say, show me thy glory, show me who you are, who are you, God? And not, again, the deconstruction, it just deconstructs down to nothing, I'm just mad. Yeah. And the religious and church hurt that we all see, people are like, yeah, but the church did this, I go, yeah. Look what they did to Jesus. Yeah. But the idea of to say, where do you want to sit and meet with God and, and, and start at the beginning, wherever that mm -hmm. is? Well, that's so good, Jim. And I would just, I would say this, that um, for the sake of the lens, right, for the sake of a clear picture of God attachment, I think it is incredibly important that we go back to the reality that God creates. Think about this. God doesn't create Adam and Eve first and then create everything, what does he do? Mm. He creates everything. Yeah. He creates the systems, the solar That's systems, so the land, the mm -hmm. animals, the fruit, the ground, the grass, the red, like all of these things are created first. And then, and this is really interesting, that the text says that God creates Adam and Eve and then he puts them in Eden, the Holy Mount. Mm -hmm. Now, the Hebrew word for put is not the normal Hebrew word for put. It's actually uh, the Hebrew word nuah, which actually means rest. And so what's actually happening, this is wild, I know, Jim. Oh, like, oh, hold on. No, 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 I'm like eating on the edge of my seat So here. what's actually, this is, so I think interesting, what God actually does is he takes Adam and Eve and he puts them, he puts humanity in Eden, not in a position to work for rest, but in a posture of rest from wow. which they are to work from. Now, why is this so important to the concept of God attachment? 
when God places Adam and Eve in Eden, the very first things that they're seeing is the providence of God all around them. Mm. They're seeing the trees that are good uh, for their shade. Like they're seeing the fruit that comes from, they're seeing animals that are not trying to destroy and kill Mm -hmm. them. They're they're seeing the good pleasure of God, the kindness of God, the Mm. mercy of God, like like evidence of God's goodness, the provision of God everywhere around them. And so what, why would, like what better origin story of God attachment could you ask for than Adam and Eve? And then notice what the enemy does. What the enemy does is goes after the attachment that we have to God. Did God really say? Mm -hmm. What if you actually could be more than you ought to be? And then we could do, I was having a fantastic conversation about this with, I've already mentioned her one time, our friend uh, Shay um, Tate Hill. I gotta slow down every time I do it. Shay Tate Hill. Because she just got married. Because she just got married. And then Maddie uh, Greenfield. Uh, And they helped me think through this. But this is so fascinating. When the enemy takes Jesus in, uh, it, actually, this is actually even more wild. The Spirit Keep of God. Keep being wild, I love it. <laughs> the Spirit of God leads Jesus into the desert, actually, in Luke 4. So the Spirit of God leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. And so when the enemy tempts Jesus, what the enemy is trying to do is detach Jesus from the perfect communion with the Godhead that he's already in. Mm. It is a it is a echo of the Adam story. It really is. That's and where Adam and Eve fail... <laughs> and they become detached, what Jesus does on the cross is actually provide a way for you and I and our humanity Mm -hmm. to be retached to God. And he mediates that retachment. He's our faithful high priest that makes that possible. And you know, it's so good, Joel. And you know what Jesus says over and over and over in the resistance of the enemy and the continued, uh, continued attachment to God? It is written. It is written. It is written. Yep. And I think this is such a big point because if we want to attach to God and make it a more secure attachment rather than an avoidant attachment with God or an anxious attachment with God, I feel like we've got to make peace with the goodness of God. Mm. And so many Mm -hmm. times we want the goodness of God to be our definition of good. We want the goodness of God to be the outcome that we want. We want the goodness of God uh, to, we wanna attach it to like, will God do what I assume a good God should do? Like, will he really address the wrongs? Mm. Will he really make sure that the people that have hurt me, like, will he really protect me? You know, will he really make good from wrong. And I think so many times we're looking at our circumstances so much and saying, do my circumstances line up to equal to the goodness of God? And Hmm. that's really hard because if that's the lens we're looking through, then we want to attach to God based on him doing the good things we assume he should be doing for us. That's where I spell God, by the way, right here with you. G-O-D doesn't stand for God on demand. We're an Mm -hmm. on-demand society. You better do it. God, will you do this? It's more, I think, the demand of you better Better do do this. Mm -hmm. You owe it. So I heard this statement yesterday in a focus group that I was working with, and it was actually Amanda Bacon's sister. Mm -hmm. And um, she's in a group where they're all going through a very similar hard thing. Mm -hmm. And each week they come together and they're supporting one another, encouraging one another, studying scripture together. But here's what's hard about the group. They're all going through a similar struggle, but they're all having different outcomes. So sometimes it can seem like, wow, God is really being good to her because he fixed that. God's really being good to her because wow, look at the miracle there. God's been good to her because wow, look how he provided for her, protected her. And it can be easy in a group like that to go, yeah, but why didn't God do that for me? Sure. Mm-hmm. And so then it can make you shaky with the goodness of God. But here's what Amanda's sister said. She manages that internally by simply saying, wow, her pathway to God's glory is Hmm. different than mine. Right. Like we are all headed. If we know God, believe God, and we have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, then we are all headed to God's glory. It's just our pathway may be different. But if we wanna stay on the pathway to God's glory, then we've got to learn to stay properly attached to God, not based on his activity, but based on who he is. Yeah, and this is so important that 
um, God's glory, you and I, humanity, was never designed to be absorbers of God's glory. Mm -hmm. We cannot absorb the glory of God. Reflect it. We are designed to be reflectors, agents of reflection of God's glory, that it would come and shine through us onto others. Um, and yeah, I think that's a, that's a powerful example. Good. So Joel, answer this for me. Let's say we love the Lord. We believe the Lord. We are following hard after the Lord. And yet sometimes in the quietness of our heart, we feel pretty distant from God. Mm -hmm. And it's not because we have some big plan B, like I'm mm -hmm. gonna run away from God. It's simply because we cannot make sense of what He allows. We cannot make sense of what's going on in our life. And we read the scriptures and it feels like God has such big promises in the scripture. So why does it feel like he's not keeping those promises wow. to me? So I'm gonna say something. I wanna say it with, with kindness and with sensitivity because it's a little bit difficult, but just because something is hard to hear doesn't mean that it's not truth that we need mm -hmm. to hear. Um, I think of the Israelites in Egypt. They had been waiting for years for, for deliverance. They're waiting for years and years and years for, God had promised them, I'm gonna get you out, I'm gonna get you out, I'm gonna get you out. And they're not out. And then one day, God makes a way. And there's a whole new generation of Israelites that are about to walk into Canaan, into the promised land. And for them, they're living in the reality of the promise of God. And yet there were generations past of Israelites that did not even experience that goodness. So what the principle here that is at play is sometimes when we are thinking of these things, we're thinking in the context of me, myself, and I. Mm. We're thinking about my immediate future. We're thinking about my immediate context. When God is thinking about good for you and I, He's thinking about good in the context of His perfect vision of past, present, and future. And so what might feel like the best good for us in our limited understanding might have unknown tragic consequences for us mm. in the future. Well, you and I can't see that, but you know who does see that? God. God. He sees it and he looks me. And so this is the faithfulness and the kindness of God where we go, okay, whatever I'm walking through and enduring through right now, the distance that I might feel from God, it, that, that distance, um, it is not evidence uh, of God's negligence or his abandonment. What this could be is a pause, a, a moment while we're waiting for his goodness to play out in the future. I was talking to some friends the other day mm. and I think people get really frustrated when they're in delays, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I've, I had just, just this thought, like delays are not evidence of God's denial in our lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Delays are actually divine redirections wrapped up in a peculiar package of grace. And the peculiarness of the delay mm -hmm. is what makes it a God thing because it looks and feels and seems so unexpected. And that's how God works. I think oh, sometimes <clears throat> we have greater faith in our fears coming true than in God coming through. Yes. And yep. that has, I remember I wrote that in my journal and I was like, oh, yeah. I don't really wanna admit that, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But sometimes I'm more certain that something terrible is gonna happen to me mm -hmm. than that I'll experience God's goodness. Yeah. And I like that you brought up, you know, the children of Israel being delivered because recently I was looking at Instagram and um, Nikki Koziar did something that was so mm -hmm. fascinating. It was this little clip where she said, do you know what manna actually means? If you translate the word manna, because of course manna is when the children of Israel were in the desert mm -hmm. and they needed to eat, God gave them manna, manna like heaven. rain down from heaven. And she said, manna actually means, what is this? <laughs> and I was so fascinated. I think I have thought about that pretty much every day because you know, mm -hmm. sometimes, like you said, God's goodness is wrapped in a very peculiar package. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many times I have attempted to detach from God because his provision <laughs> doesn't look at all. And so, like I thought it would. And so it's almost like, this is God's provision. And I'm like, what is this? And yet, I think, as I walk forward in my life, 
some of those things, maybe not all, but some of those things, I'll look back and go, oh, wow, mm -hmm. that was God's perfect provision. Yeah. And so what <laughs> I need to do, I think, in my life, is I, I wanna have a secure attachment with the Lord, is I need to trace His hand of faithfulness going mm -hmm. backwards in my life, because mm -hmm. I can't see into the future. But what are those things today that in those years, I looked at and said, what is this? How could this be God's goodness? How could this be God's provision? How could this be what I need? And yet, as it's played out over the years, there are certain things I look back and go, God was exactly right. He knew exactly what I needed. And I'll give you an example of that. During a really, really hard season um, that my marriage was falling apart and I was, just emotionally devastated by what was happening. Um, I decided to take some months off for ministry. And because I have a hard time sitting with myself, I'm just gonna go ahead and admit that. You're I decided- doing much better. Yes, I am doing much better on that. But back then I was like, okay, I had like two days where I was like, okay, I'm taking a break, but what good is this gonna do for me? And so I decided to just go ahead and make all these appointments that I needed to make. The appointments that sometimes we put off, you mm -hmm. know, like health checkups and stuff. Yeah. And so one of those was I made an appointment for a mammogram. I was not due for my mammogram mm. yet. I could have stretched it out much further, you know? And I have no history of breast cancer in my family, none of that. But because I had time, I went. Mm. And they saw something abnormal. Mm. And then I went back and they saw something abnormal again. And I went back and I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. Mm. And they caught it really early and I was able to have a double mastectomy and praise God, I'm healthy today. But mm. here's what I know. This is perfect example of me looking back and saying, I was so angry and almost detached by God. Like why in the world is this happening? And now I have to take a break from ministry. Why in the world would, I mean, it's good for me to do ministry. It was good for this relationship to be together. Like, why in the world? And I'm not saying God caused it, but I'm saying God allowed right. it. And as I look back now, back then, when I said, what is this? Now I say, wow, that break that I had mm. to take because my marriage was falling apart is the very thing that got me to the doctor and is the very thing that actually saved my life. Mm. I've got one, one as well, Lise. Um, almost a decade ago, I think it's gonna be a decade ago, uh, I thought I was crushing it in my career. I worked for a Bible software company and got to do a lot of amazing things, traveling an insane amount. And I got to present at Women of Faith in these arena events. And um, it's going awesome. And I get into the back around lunchtime and all these incredible Bible teachers are there. And there's this one gal who just kept watching my presentation, just each week, each week, and finally came to me and just said, hey, when are you gonna stop selling Bible software and start actually really teaching the Bible? And I was like, huh? Boom. And that set a trajectory, and by the way, her name was Lisa Turkhurst, and that set a trajectory where I didn't know at the time that um, the travel was incredibly difficult on my wife. We had three little boys, and my marriage was not in a great spot. And so it was a really powerful moment oh for um, where I look back on the faithfulness of God and go, man, what would have happened if I just kept grinding away? Because that was the thing I was supposed to do. And the beauty of his faithfulness in the future um, and the obedience of a woman who just said, hey, I'm going to do um, what is right and see something that maybe he didn't see himself. So I want to thank mm -hmm. you for that, Lisa. But that was uh, a moment that I look back and I go, wow. And then here, 10 years later, being able to sit and do therapy and theology with y'all and a theology of remembrance, thinking back then um, of God's faithfulness and provision. It, yeah, it, oh. didn't it? We say it. It touched something in you, yay, 10 years ago, and it touched something in you 10 seconds ago mm -hmm. to recall that, right, and to remember. This I call to mind so much in Scripture and to say, God, you've always been faithful to me. And like he's surprised if I'm ticked at him. Oswald Chambers, who wrote my utmost for his highest, said sin is the suspicion that God is not good. Mm. And to start with, again, Jeremiah 2.13, God said, my people have committed two sins. They've said, you're not enough, God. 
He said, you're the fountain of living. He's the fountain of living water. We forsake that and get broken cisterns in the ground. We can hold, we can only uh, hold muddy water. And maybe you're tired today of digging uh, broken cisterns and you haven't come to God and just said, God, I am angry with you. It's not, he'll never have breaking news to God. Can you believe this? The Trinity's ever going to say, hey, look at what Crest just did. <laughs> There's no breaking news there. He says, it's good to hear from you. It's good to hear from you. I think that's a salient point. I'm always reminded of Nehemiah, right? If you've been away from God, and he says, but if you return, though you be dispersed into the far of the skies, I'll bring you to a place I've chosen mm -hmm. to make my name dwell. You talk about the attachment, attach, detach, reattach. Maybe a whole lot of times to say, the old hymn, I've wandered far away from God, but now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod, now I'm coming home. And I just say, God says, good to see you. Luke 15, the prodigal. I mean, all these attachment things are, come on home. Just wanna see you. Come mm -hmm. hang out with me. Step up into your calling. Mm -hmm. There's the attachment, I think. Yep.